Mommy! Surprise! All three of my little ones waved, and two of them screamed and jumped as I walked toward the ship's ramp. I pretended to be shocked to see Steve and our kids, covering my face with my hands with an exaggerated look of surprise on my face. What are you doing here? Surprise, Mommy, my husband said with a mysterious smile. We thought we'd come and see you off. Where's Edna? I smiled back at Steve. I think she's already on board. We decided not to meet in this chaos. The children were so excited that they demanded my attention. They were all talking at the same time, so I crouched down and hugged little Trixie. At three years old, she had just stopped wearing diapers, but still had the chubby arms and legs of a toddler. Like her older sister, she was a talker, and her lisp was just too cute. Are you going on that big ship? She asked with her wide blue eyes. Yes, I'm going to. What will you do on a big ship? Well, you can swim there, watch movies, have a gym and a cafe, so I'll be busy. I want to go on a cruise with you, Mommy. Well, not this time. But maybe one day we can go as a family, okay? How long will you be away, Mommy? Katie was already tall and thin, but just two years ago she looked like Trixie. And like Trixie and Steve, she had almost white hair. We loved spending time outside and the summer sun would bleach their hair while I could only pick out a few strands of my brown hair. My tan made up for it, however. It's five days and four nights, so I'll be home Friday afternoon. Katie's bottom lip curved into her too cute grimace. I kissed her little nose. No, no, little angel. Everything is fine. I'll be back before you notice I'm gone. We'll miss you, Mommy. Charlie was my little man. Well, at eight years old, he looked like an exact copy of me, but his personality was all Steve. Serious, diligent, responsible. I was worried that he didn't know how to have fun, but I had no doubt that he would always be reliable. I will miss you too, but Dad will be with you. He will take good care of you. I know, Charlie said, but we want you home too. Oh, I love you all so much, I said hugging them all and squeezing them in my arms. Trixie and Katie twirled and giggled while Charlie stood motionless. And I'll be home before you know it. I stood up and grabbed my roller carry-on bag. My other suitcase was already loaded onto the ship. I turned to kiss Steve, but he was gone. I looked around but didn't see him. Children, do you see Daddy? They looked around in confusion, and since they were small, they couldn't see much. My eyes scanned the crowd of hurrying people, but he was nowhere to be seen. I looked at my watch and saw that I only had five minutes left to get on board. I called his number, but it immediately went to voicemail. He must have been talking to someone. Steve, where are you? I need to get on the ship. Please hurry back. The children looked at me and they looked worried. I smiled brightly. I'm sure he just went to the toilet or something. He'll be back soon. What are you going to do with Dad while I'm on the cruise? We're going to go to the pool. Trixie loved the water, especially the local pool. Dad said we could go to McDonald's for dinner one night. Oh, he said that, didn't he? Make sure it's just one night, okay? I was making fun of Katie. She twirled and giggled. We're going to play mini golf tomorrow night. Are you going to beat Daddy again, Charlie? I think he allows me to win. He was so serious and my heart sank a little at his realization. My little man was growing up. You still have to make your shots. I repeated what Steve always told him when they played. If you make your shots, it doesn't matter what Daddy does. This brought a small smile out of Charlie. I hugged him and stood up again. Where was Steve? I carefully examined the area and saw two uniformed men heading towards the ship's ramp. Crap. I ran towards them, keeping the children in sight. Sorry, I have my boarding pass, but my husband ran to the toilet and hasn't returned yet. I can't leave my children. Can you wait a couple more minutes? The young man raised his eyebrows and looked at the older man. We can give you another minute, but that's it. Okay, thank you. I called Steve's number, and it went to voicemail again. Steve! I'm going to miss boarding. Please hurry! I called him again, hoping that this time I would get through. Did not work out. I looked at the sailors and shrugged. I'm sure he'll be back soon. 
He knows I need to get on the ship. Sorry, madam. We need to get this ship sailing. Damn it. I quickly sent a text message. Miss the ship. As I walked back to the kids, I called Steve again. Thank you very much, Steve. I miss the ship. I can't believe you left me like this. I hope you have a good explanation. I watched with sadness as the gangplank departed from the ship. So much for my vacation. My phone vibrated, and I saw a text. Oh, no. What happened? I answered quickly. Later. My children needed me. I gathered them up and led them to a shady bench to wait for my husband. Mommy, aren't you going to the ship? Not today, honey. Why? Your dad went somewhere and I couldn't leave you alone. I didn't want to defend Steve at that moment. In fact, he's been acting like a real jerk these past few weeks. He stayed late at work some nights, and although he tried to be attentive to the children, he was distracted, he barely spoke to me alone. In fact, instead of spending the evenings with us as usual, he would go to Tony's bar or work in the yard until dark. He also checked his phone more often. One morning I got curious and checked who he was texting with and discovered that he had put a password on his phone. Did he cheat on me? This thought made me nervous. But it couldn't be Steve. He was so conscientious. But something has changed. And now this. He knew how much I was looking forward to this cruise, a little break from the endless demands of being a mother, a wife, an employee, a daughter, and all the other things that were piling up. Five days off for himself didn't seem like too much to ask, and when I first mentioned it in April, he was thrilled. But he pulled a surprise. Luckily, poor Katie couldn't keep a secret. To save her life, and then disappeared. I was more than a little annoyed with my husband. Where was he? We waited in the shadows for almost half an hour, and by then I had already run out of ideas to distract them. Trixie was moody, and Katie was just around the corner. I tried calling Steve several times, but it always went to voicemail. My irritation decreased and my anxiety increased by the minute. Where could he be? I didn't want to upset the kids, so I kept asking them questions and making up silly games as I went along, but all kids have limits, and we overcame them. Bringing them home was a problem. I was driven here by an Uber car, and I didn't know where Steve parked his car. I checked my bag and found that I didn't have the keys to his car. I ordered another Uber to take us home. We had to take a chance without a child seat for Trixie, but the trip was short-lived. The driver didn't mind much but I insisted that he only use street roads. After 10 minutes of waiting and another 15 minutes of driving, we arrived at our small ranch. I called Steve along the way. Cute, please call me and tell me you're okay. I'm starting to worry. I'm taking the kids home, so get there as soon as you get this. Steve's car was nowhere to be seen, but he may have left it in the garage. If he was at home, he was not. The kids were cranky, but subdued when I brought them into the house and I put Trixie to bed. She only slept every other time, but I hoped that after the morning's adventures, she would be more tired than usual. Katie immediately turned on Disney, and Charlie went to his room and closed the door. I took my rolling bag into our bedroom and left it there while I went to the bathroom. I sent text messages while sitting on the toilet. Sorry, Steve and the kids arrived. He's gone somewhere. I couldn't leave the children. In response, I received a sad emoticon. I understand. I responded with my sad emoji, then went to the kitchen to get a snack and iced tea. I didn't notice them at first, but as I sat down at the table to wonder where my husband might have gone, my heart sank. Steve placed his phone in its distinctive silver case in the middle of the table. I knew Steve did it because he was perfectly aligned with the edges of the table. He had an eye for detail and symmetry, which was essential as a high-quality paint artist. What cooled me down was his wedding ring lying on the dark phone screen. Crap. I went into our bedroom and saw that most of his clothes were gone. His tablet was also missing from the bedside table, and a check of the living room revealed that his laptop and all our files were also gone. Looks like my marriage is over. Tears flowed, although I knew that it would not change anything. But I also knew that I had destroyed Steve. He was no coward, so if he couldn't face me, 
it was because it would have destroyed him, and despite my sins against him, I loved him deeply. Steve was an amazing person. He was a wonderful lover and a reliable partner who sacrificed his comfort for me throughout our eleven years together, nine of them as husband and wife. He could be stubborn and could focus on one task at the expense of everything else, including me, but I still got my way four times out of five. I could be impulsive and easily irritated, but he was calm and stable, and he balances me out. I really needed this, especially before having kids. He was an incredible craftsman. His painting business flourished after the first couple of difficult years because he combined creativity with responsibility and now had a waiting list thanks to feedback from his grateful customers. And he shined as a father. He adored each of our children, and his patience with them was endless. And now, he is gone. So why was I trying to escape on a cruise with Chad Mayberry? I was a dental assistant because I could do the job while the kids were at school or daycare and be home at two when they got out. The new dentist started working in our office about ten months ago, when Trixie was in the midst of her terrible two years and Katie was adjusting to preschool, she was so affectionate. Charlie was more reserved but still demanded my attention. The demands were relentless. Steve's business was not all-encompassing, but he came home tired and often distracted. He would cheer up for the kids, but by the time we put them to bed, he was exhausted. I probably do too. We tried to make time for ourselves, but it was difficult. A once-a-month Saturday night date was too few. Sex on Fridays became an obligation and spontaneity became a distant memory. Our life, although it was what we wanted, was depressing, and while I didn't resent Steve or the kids, I resented the way we lived. I wasn't ready to be my parents, completely settled and predictable. Chad was also married, but they had no children. They seemed to live more independently than we did, and because they both worked in professional fields, Sylvia was in IT sales, they could afford frequent travel and exciting vacations, and they often went on vacation separately. The first time I spoke with Chad after his wisdom teeth were removed, he had just returned from hiking the Grand Canyon with his college friends. Sylvia went to Santa Fe for an art exhibition with her best friend. Chad was funny and enjoyed making fun of everyone, including me. I didn't usually eat lunch due to my part-time job, but he would meet me in the kitchen for a mid-morning snack. I talked a lot about my family and maybe complained a little about how my family took me for granted. I envied his free lifestyle, disposable income, and minimal responsibilities. Let's go for a walk tomorrow, he said with a smile. We can go to the beach for lunch and be back in time for you to pick up the kids. That's what we did. It was a delightful break from my regular treadmill routine. Adult conversation without expectations. I didn't have to repeat a single word I said and I didn't have to choose anyone but myself. Chad drove the car so I could relax and the waiters took care of me instead of me taking care of everyone around me. I enjoyed the break and that evening at home with my family was the best I could remember. Steve commented on my smile and we had midweek sex for the first time in months. I was happy and hugged, Steve tightly with my arms and legs, and almost cried because I loved him so much. Chad suggested another lunch a couple of weeks later, and it quickly became a regular occurrence. Most of the time we would just grab a sandwich or salad and sit in the park to talk, but when neither of us had an appointment after lunch, we would wander a little further. I wish I could say Chad seduced me, but that didn't happen. It was I who opened the door. However, it did pass, so the effect is on both of us. One day over lunch, he asked me about Steve. I think I spend more one-on-one -on -one time with you than with him. I wonder if he's tired of my charm. That would be a shame. He looked down at my very substantial chest. Your charm is significant. I blushed. Well, you have your own charm, looking at his lap with a smirk and a raised eyebrow. And then sex was on the table. Our teasing became more intense, and I began to think of Chad as a lover. He was handsome in an exquisite way. Steve was a stud, tall, slender, with broad shoulders, bright blue eyes, and calloused hands. We had lunch once, sometimes twice a week, until one day we had to cancel several meetings in a row. 
Do you want to go to the beach? He asked with a smile. I bet. Instead of going to our usual dockside bistro, Chad stopped at a surf beach motel. I'd like to try your charm, he said. His eyes sparkled with desire, and I felt overwhelmed by the thought that he was arousing me. So we had sex. He only made it through one round, but he lasted a long time. It wasn't amazing like my best performances with Steve, but it was good nonetheless. We had an hour and a half, which was enough to not feel rushed. I was surprised that I didn't feel guilty. I guess I just thought of my time with Chad as a time out from normal life. It didn't affect my marriage other than it relieved me of some stress, so there was no reason to feel bad. I completely loved Steve. He was my life partner. Chad was just a trip to the gym or a nice massage. We never planned our affairs, allowing the universe to determine our possibilities. The first couple of months thanks to the schedule, but then the practice got busier and patients became more reliable, and six weeks went by without any appointments. And then we talked about a short cruise. This should have been a nice break for both of us. After the kids went to bed, I broached the subject with Steve. Honey, Edna from work won a Caribbean cruise for two. She had just broken up with her boyfriend and she asked me to join her. What do you think? When? In six weeks or so. In the first week of June. For how many days? Chad and I haven't discussed this yet, so I was just guessing. I think it's for five days. I can clarify. That sounds like a good idea. You've worked very hard here. I don't say this often enough, but thank you for everything you do for our family. He hugged me with his long, strong arms. I felt like the happiest woman in the whole world. I loved him so much that I took him to our bedroom and enjoyed him. I never thought about Chad when I was with Steve. There was no need for this. Steve was my real life. Chad was my casual fun. Chad and I chose June so we would have time to convince our spouses. I chose Edna because Steve had never met her, while Chad said his friend Jeremy won the cruise. Neither Steve nor Sylvia objected. Perhaps six weeks was too long. I don't know how Steve found out, but judging by his change in behavior, it didn't take him long once he found out about me and Chad. I wondered if he had arranged for Katie to tell me they were going to surprise me at the dock, so Chad and I had to board the ship separately. And now I was looking at Steve's phone and his wedding ring, and I had absolutely no idea what to do next. It looked like I was going to become a single mother, which left little time for anything other than childcare. If I thought my life before was a thankless task, I suspected it would be even more depressing now that I would be doing it without a partner. Crap. I took a deep breath and started making phone calls. I started with his brother. Hi, Paul. Have you seen your brother today? No. Was he late? Were you more reserved? Did he know? Was he lying to me? God, how I hated this. Okay, thank you. If you hear anything from him, please ask him to call me. I had the same conversation with his parents, although they asked why I wasn't on the cruise. And then with his sister Beth and his cousin and two best friends. I had a feeling that they knew something, but their answers did not go beyond our normal communication. So I decided that it was my own paranoia. The kids came looking for me, so I switched into mom mode for dinner. During another dinner of macaroni and cheese with baby carrots, my kids seemed to love orange food, Katie spoke up. Where is dad? He said he'll be home this week. Well, our plans have changed, honey. I'll be here now. But where is dad? He always comes home for dinner. Charlie, do you know where dad is? Charlie looked at me seriously and then slowly shook his head. No. I believed him. Steve would never burden his children with something like that. I smiled and distracted them with questions about their summer camps, but I began to panic. I suppressed my anxiety, cleaned the kitchen, and then sent the girls to the bath. It was after eight when Katie and Trixie went to bed, and I left Charlie reading in his room for another half hour before returning to turn off the lights. Looking at his phone, I knew I couldn't contact him that way, so I typed an email on my screen and sent it to his personal and work email addresses. My dear Steve, I hurt you deeply and I'm so sorry. I love you despite what you may think about my actions. I would like you to give me a chance to show you that what I write is true. Please come home. I really need you, but if you can't do this for me, then please come back for the sake of our children. 
They're already upset that you missed dinner today, and they'll only get more scared and worried the longer you're gone. Please go back to your family. I love you, and only you. I didn't sleep for a long time, hoping for an answer. I ignored the text from Chad asking how I was doing. Finally, a little after ten, I went to bed. I needed to be fresh for my babies in the morning. I hoped the new day would bring something from Steve, but he didn't bring it. But I got a call from my husband's sister, which burned me. What the hell is wrong with you? She screamed when I answered. What? What do you mean? I mean, my brother may be clueless, and he might forget half of what you want from the grocery store because he refuses to write everything down, but he's a good guy. He's the best guy I know. So why the hell are you cheating on him? I... I don't know what you're talking about. What did he say to you? Steve didn't tell me anything. Paul had to pick him up from the drunk cell this morning. He was in terrible condition. He had a split lip and abrasions all over his face. Paul thought he was still drunk. And he told Paul that you don't love him anymore because you're cheating on him with a guy at work. Crap. My heart broke once again for Steve. He never drank much. And when he got drunk, he just became funny. Being so big and strong, he could hurt in a fight, but he was such a kind guy, and he always relieved tension by talking. He had never fought in all the years that I knew him, and there were no stories of fights before either. What did he do? What have I done? I need to talk to Steve. Is he with Paul? I don't know where he is, but Jesus, how can you cheat on the best guy in the world? I didn't have an answer, so I said, Trixie wanted me, and hung up. How could I cheat on Steve? The only thing that came to my mind was that I didn't cheat on Steve. At least, not in my mind. My relationship with Chad had absolutely nothing to do with my marriage. Nonsense, I know, because marriage, if it is right, should always be full and permanent. No breaks, no vacations. It can be exhausting, but this connection should never be broken. Otherwise, you will only be left with ashes and relatives hurling abuse at you. Now I saw it completely clearly, realizing that I had destroyed a good man whom I loved. I needed to contact him to see if there was anything I could do to improve this situation. I called Paul, but no answer. So I called his parents. I thought the conversation with his sister was bad, but I would have preferred it a million times over another conversation with Steve's mom. Hello? Hi, Margaret. Is Steve there? All I heard was a sob and then silence. Margaret? Are you okay? Silence. Are you here? Margaret? Finally, the trembling whisper answered. I was so glad when he found you. I thought you were the best thing that could happen to my son. He was so happy, but you were the worst. Stunned, I waited for her to finish. But it looks like she's done, because the conversation is over. Crap. If Trixie hadn't come in and asked me to tie a bow on her doll's dress... I would have fallen apart right then and there. But I had children to take care of, so I put on a smile, and we made it through the rest of the day. My children were innocent, and I knew I had to do everything I could to preserve their innocence for as long as possible. This lasted another day. They became increasingly confused and upset that Steve wasn't home with us, so I had to tell the kids that their dad was staying with his brother. I tried to tell them that he loved them very much, but that we had a fight and we needed to be apart for a while. They didn't want this at all, and Charlie seemed especially upset. Is Daddy coming home? Of course, expensive. We need to discuss some things, but he loves you and your sisters so much that he won't be gone long. He loves you? I hope so. I smiled in self-defense as his question pierced right through me. Sometimes parents fight, and we need to talk about it so we can be happy again. But even when we're upset with each other, we always love you. He nodded seriously and left. My heart broke again, considering how protective Steve's friends, and especially his family, were of him. My secret was well solved. He was wounded, badly wounded, but I couldn't get even a hint of where he might be. When they did not evade my calls, his defenders grew petrified. Nobody said anything about him. I left messages with the few people who spoke to me, begging Steve to call me, or at least set up a meeting with the kids. I only cried when the children could not hear me, 
but then I cried bitter tears. We were so perfect together, but now we are not, and never will be. Five lives are directly affected, and who knows how many others are indirectly affected. And it's entirely my fault. My hope was gone by Thursday evening. I'd run out of ideas and resign myself to waiting for Steve to make the first move, wondering when I might hear from him, hoping it wouldn't be through a mediator in a lawsuit. I went to bed that night sadder than ever. I clearly did not have a defender among the people supporting him. No one spoke about balance, patience, balance. I didn't deserve forgiveness, but I thought maybe he had enough love to respond at least a little. Even anger would be better than silence, but silence was what I got. The phone rang on Friday afternoon. My heart jumped into my throat, but then I saw who was calling. I almost ignored the call. But since Steve left, I decided to face troubles head on, even if they were unpleasant. Hi, Chad. Sylvia knows. I received divorce papers when I got off the ship today. Crap. I closed my eyes and took deep breaths to calm myself. Steve left us. I have no idea where he might be. Crap. How did they know? I have no idea. But I think Steve knew soon after I told him about the cruise. He's been acting strange for weeks. And what happened on the pier was a ruse. He left me with the children so that I couldn't get on the ship. And while I was waiting there, I'm sure he came home, took his things, and left. Crap. I was silent, breathing slowly and deeply. How are you? Do you want me to come to you? That would be a terrible idea, Chad. I don't blame you since I was equally to blame, but if I never saw you again, I would be happy. When we work together, I will act professionally. But the rest of the time... Please don't talk to me. Is it true? Is this how you feel about me? I love my husband deeply. I don't know why I left with you, but it cost me my wonderful future with Steve and my children. I don't want to be reminded of my failure. I understand. Well, if you change your mind, call me. I don't give up on friends, and I certainly don't give up on lovers. Bye, Chad. Lovers. Apparently everyone except me saw us that way, but I never loved him, not for a minute. I only loved Steve, but Steve will never believe it again. The weekend was terrible, Steve was unavailable, and the children became increasingly frustrated. Trixie had two unpleasant incidents on Friday night, and Katie suffered from nightmares and slept with me on Saturday. Charlie was stoic and strong as always in the face of all the sadness and that was even worse for me. I could feel his pain and embarrassment, and it didn't take long for it to rub off on Steve. It must be destroyed. And I was the instrument of his destruction, not just a tool. I was also the hand that used it. He was the man I vowed to love and respect for the rest of my life, and I destroyed him, with excessive cruelty, and without hesitation. I read once that every person is the hero of their own story, I became the exception to the rule. I was extremely cruel to the person who should have been the most important to me. Instead, I showed myself that I was the most important. I wanted most of all to run away, to hide where my friends would never find me. It won't change what I did, but at least I won't have to face the daily judgment that I deserve. But I couldn't do it. My children needed me to be a fully functional parent, no matter what was going on with me. With Katie snuggled next to me in our Dabla bed, I decided to be the best mother I could, putting aside my anguish, guilt, and lingering remorse as I cared for our children. I may not be Steve's wife anymore, but I will be the best damn mother to Charlie, Katie, and little Trixie. When I crawled out of bed on Sunday morning, I had a new resolution, a committed goal. I fed the kids waffles and bacon and orange juice, then settled them in the living room in front of the TV. After cleaning, I called Beth from the kitchen. She was the only one in Steve's family who answered all my calls, but I think she only did it to scold me again. What the hell do you want now? Good morning, Beth. I want you to tell Steve to see the kids. They really need him. I know he doesn't want to see me and I hate it, but I accept it. But his children need him, and he needs to put his pain aside and reassure them that he loves them and that everything will be okay. In order? You are crazy. What will be okay about this? I wanted to cry, but I pulled myself together. Steve won't be well for a long time. I'll never feel good. But damn it, 
Our kids need to be okay, and Steve needs to do everything he can to make that happen. I wish I wasn't such a mindless witch, and I will carry the shame of my actions to my grave, but I will put it all aside to take care of Charlie, Katie, and Trixie, and he needs to do the same. I don't expect him to take me back, but they need him, and they need him now. Crap. I don't think he's been sober for half an hour since he left your house on Monday. You have no idea what you did to him. My heart sank. I knew what I did to him. I know. I understand. I destroyed our marriage and destroyed my husband. If I could kill myself right now to fix this, I would. But it won't change anything. Won't fix anything for the two of us. But we can fix this for our children. And you and Paul and Margaret and Richard must help him understand this. I'd like to do this. I would like to remain his partner to help. But he will have to do it on his own. Same as me. Our children are more important than us. And you must help him understand this. She was silent for a moment. And then said much more softly, I'll talk to Paul and our parents and see what they think. Thank you, Beth. I know this may seem far-fetched, but I love Steve. I wish I hadn't done what I did. I can't even understand why I did this, but I did. And now I have to live with this forever, knowing that I hurt the person I love. I'm not the woman I thought I was. You are not the woman we thought you were. It hurt, but I didn't cry. I was emotionally numb. I focused my energies on the well-being of my children, which helped keep self-pity and self-hatred at bay. I went into the living room, gathered my children around me, and started Encanto again. We went to the park after grabbing a snack after the movie, and when we got back, I quickly made lunch of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, sliced apples, and milk. I put Trixie to bed, settled Katie down with crayons and coloring books, and Charlie immersed himself in a book about airplanes. After calming down for a moment, I checked my phone. There were no calls or text messages, but I knew what I needed to do. Hi, Mom. Is Daddy there with you? Hi, dear. Yes, he's here somewhere. Do you want to talk to him? I need to talk to you both. Fine. I think he's in the backyard. I will find it. As children? When will you and Steve bring them to us? It almost broke me. My new resolve wavered but held firm. That's what I want to talk about. Oh, are you okay? I need to talk to you and Dad. Well, he's right here. They discussed putting it on speakerphone for about 40 seconds, not losing patience as they kept messing up. They were both delighted when it finally worked out and congratulated each other on being so capable. My parents adored each other. I will never have this. What's wrong, honey? I took a deep breath. I wanted to let you know that Steve has moved out. He found out that I had an affair. I don't know what will happen next, but you need to know about it. The telephone line was filled with thick silence. Are you... Are you in love with another man? Mom asked. No. She couldn't help but let out a short sob. No. I love Steve. I love him so much. I don't know what I did with anyone else. Still silent. Any chance you can fix this? I don't think so. Steve left on Monday and hasn't responded to anything I've said since. I don't know where he is. His sister says he is devastated. He's been drinking all week. Oh, poor man. My parents always adored Steve. I closed my eyes and breathed evenly. I forced myself to continue. Yes, I know. I will always regret the way I hurt him. But I may need your help with the kids at this point until we get settled, whatever that looks like. Of course, dear. Call us anytime you need help, Dad said. They can stay with us when needed, and you too. Parents' love never fades, even when their child disappoints. I almost cried right then. Thank you. I love you both very much. We love you too, honey. I cried for a long time after I hung up. I didn't deserve my parents. I didn't deserve Steve. I didn't deserve my family. But they all needed me. And I had to be the best I could be for all of them. This commitment was my lifeline. I couldn't drown myself because the people I loved needed me. 
even if they didn't love me anymore. Beth called back. Steve wants to see the kids. You can take them to our parents in an hour. Certainly. Thank you, Beth. They miss him so much. I hope they give him something else to think about. He really needs support, something to focus on. He's completely broken. I know he doesn't want anything to do with me, but if you think there's anything I can do, please let me know. I really love it. I know I've lost my right to impose, but I'm here for whatever he needs from me. Fine. The kids were extremely happy to see Steve, and they were excited about going to see their grandparents. Katie and Trixie rushed to the door as soon as I let them out of the car, but Charlie stayed behind. Aren't you coming with us? Not today. I have a couple things to do, but I'll be back for you in a couple of hours, okay? He nodded, serious as ever, and walked towards the door, where Steve's mom was waiting for him with a big hug. She didn't even look at me. I returned home and cried again. The house seemed both suffocating and empty. Everything seemed smaller, more compact, and nothing mattered. Family photographs mocked me. They looked ancient and frozen, relics of another time. They could have been in sepia. The furniture, books, DVDs, and video games seemed like they belonged to an era long closed. I felt like I was visiting my family's museum, looking at history. I pulled myself together as best I could before returning to get the kids. I barely recognized them. They were all subdued when Steve's mom walked them out the door to my car, and they were very quiet on the way home. I took them into the house and prepared dinner. I fried some chicken, baked some frozen potato sticks, and chopped up some red peppers and some carrots. I love my children, but their food tasties are limited and high in carbohydrates. It would be a while before I start fighting with them over this. Now they needed comfort. Nobody ate much. Charlie went to his room and I settled Katie and Trixie in front of the TV to clean the kitchen. I was almost finished when I saw Katie standing in the doorway, looking at me. Mother? Yes, darling. Why is Daddy so sad? What do you mean, Angel? He cried a lot. I think he was just happy to see you. Sometimes people cry when they are happy. You know he loves you very much. I know. He said that too. But then he still cried. I hugged my child, riding the waves of regret again. I ruined Steve's world. My love for him was the foundation of the tower he built for his life. And when that stone came out, everything else came crashing down around him. He couldn't even keep his emotions together for his children. I knew he would get better eventually, but the question was, how well? I loved Steve. I knew this with every cell of my body, and I hurt him as much as I could. Perhaps I could heal him. After all, I knew him better than he probably knew himself, but he wouldn't give me that chance, and I couldn't blame him. But I also couldn't let him suffer like that. He didn't deserve this, and my children don't deserve a broken father. My father always told me that if you break something, you have to fix it. So that's what I needed to do. I couldn't make Steve the man he was before my betrayal, but I could make him a much better person than he was now, with or without his cooperation. I had two things to work with. The first is our children. The second was how well I knew him. Children, do you know how sad your dad is? They all nodded. Well, I have a few ideas on how to cheer him up. Do you want to hear them? I almost cried from their enthusiasm. They were amazing kids, and they loved their dad so much. What does your father like to do most? Tickle me, Trixie shouted, which made us all laugh. He loves watching videos of us, said Katie. He loves ice cream, Trixie added. I smiled. I may have to be more assertive. He likes to fish, Charlie said quietly. Yes, he loves you all very much, and he loves fishing. What else? He likes to do things in the garden, Charlie said again. Yes, he loves to do it all. Do you think he would enjoy doing some of his favorite things with the people he loves the most? They all nodded again, eyes wide. I think he would really like it if you offered to do some of his favorite things with him. Can you do that next time you see him? When will he come home, Mom? I don't know, honey. But you may see him at his grandparents again very soon. Now who wants to take a bath first? After I put the girls to bed and Charlie was in his room reading, I called Beth. What the hell do you want now? She said in a tired voice. 
You haven't done enough yet? I know what I did, Beth. And Steve did nothing to deserve what I did to him. But now he needs to make our children his priority. They need him, and he needs them, too. We can help him start to heal, and that starts with him spending time with the kids. For what? Why what? Why are you doing it? You destroyed my brother, and now you want to help him? I never intended to hurt him. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, I love Steve, deep. I've always loved Steve, and I know that we can't be together now and maybe never will be again, and it breaks my heart. But I know how he can be healed, and I will do everything I can to help with that, even if he never speaks to me again. I was surprised Beth didn't answer, so I continued talking. I want him to see the children every day. It could be at our parents' house, or it could be here. It would be better here. I can leave while he's here. In fact, maybe we can share this house one week each. This way the children will remain in a familiar environment. The children will help him recover, and their love will help him recover. He's going to divorce you. It was like a white-hot knife in my chest. I hesitated but took the blow upon myself. I deserve it. I thought so, and I will mourn this for a very long time. But that doesn't change what we need to do to help him. Please, Beth, help me. Help him. Fine. I'll ask him to see the children. I'll talk to Paul and our parents about your idea of sharing your house. It makes sense to me, but only if you're not there when he's there. I will do anything short of abandoning my children. I don't want to hurt him anymore. She hung up without saying a word, which I took as progress, considering how likely it was that the word would be a slur. Work the next day was a little surreal. I swapped procedures with Edna so I wouldn't have to work closely with Chad. We were hyper-aware of each other, but no one else knew that our lives had fallen apart last week, so everyone treated us the same as always. Edna asked me how the cruise was and laughed at Steve's confusion about her accompanying me. He called her to arrange some gifts for me while I was on the ship and asked her to keep it a secret after he apologized for the confusion about who I was going with. I smiled to hide my agony and told her that in the end, I couldn't leave the kids, but that it was still good to take a break for the week. She told me what a wonderful husband I had, that he surprised me so much. I spent ten minutes in the bathroom, quietly sobbing. I picked up the kids on the way home and got them settled. I knew I was relying too much on TV to cope with the girls, so I decided to try this, as soon as the waves of that seething cauldron that was my life subside. I just couldn't do our usual games and activities right now. Our dinners were never complicated. But I tried to add things like pureed spinach to spaghetti sauce to make them eat a little better. Today, I just put a couple of frozen pizzas in the oven and chopped up an apple. This will have to be limited. When the phone rang and I saw it was Beth, I took a deep breath before answering. Steve said he wanted to see the kids. He liked the idea of alternating time in the house. In case he ever talks to you, I presented it as my idea. If he knew you suggested it, the idea would be dead on the vine. Thank you, Beth. I don't care about recognition. We just need to get Steve and Charlie and Katie and Trixie together so they can be as whole as possible. When does he want to start? Tomorrow. The fact that he was going to be the kid's sole parent for a week seemed to comfort him. He didn't drink anything today. He's still very sad, but he has some focus when he starts thinking about the kids. I appreciate you helping in this way, Beth. Don't mention it. I'm serious. And me too. If you ever mention this to Steve, he'll disown me. A bitter laugh escaped me. It was either laugh or cry again. It was the mother of all mistakes, wasn't it? I couldn't destroy my family anymore even if I wanted to. Beth fell silent, but I could feel the tension in her wavering. Finally, the words came out of her. Why? For God's sake, why? I don't know. It was like a break. Chad was friendly and nice enough, but I didn't like him at all. I don't even find him particularly sexy. But he paid attention to me simply as me, and not as a wife or mother or anything else. He just loved spending time with me. Sex happened quite suddenly, but it wasn't passionate. It was just fun. Something we did for fun. I destroyed my marriage for what was nothing more than a few trips to the gym and on a cruise. I don't know what I was thinking about this. I simply disconnected Chad from the rest of my brain. 
Now this disgusts me. It doesn't seem like it happened to anyone else, but it seems like a dream, like it wasn't reality. And now I have to live the rest of my life knowing how much I hurt the person I love for fleeting pleasures that meant nothing to me. This is so wrong. I know. She fell silent again. He spoke to a lawyer. You will receive your divorce papers this week. At work? Yes. Fine. I expected this. This is so wrong. I couldn't agree more. I pulled myself together and told everyone at work that Steve and I were getting a divorce. I said that we had problems and that it was my fault. Everyone was shocked. Well, except for Chad, but he put on a decent face, as if this were so. I decided to tell my news first, but I'm sure people will connect the dots when they find out about his marriage, too. It was incredibly awkward at first, but the two dentists hugged me and said they would help me with increasing or decreasing my hours, depending on what I needed. It really helped everyone else to at least support me a little. The documents arrived on Thursday afternoon, and I took them with me to my parents, where I stayed while Steve was with the children. His lawsuit was punitive, extremely punitive. He wanted three quarters of our assets, a house, primary custody of our three children, child support from me, no child support from him, and for me to take back my maiden name. I understood his anger and was sad about it again, but it didn't work for me. Or for Steve, I knew him. Once he recovers, he will have too many regrets about this angry settlement. And if our children were to get through our divorce as healthy as possible, they needed to see us treat each other kindly. When I met with my lawyer, I insisted on a fair offer and indicated that I had no intention of bidding. I accepted that my marriage was over. I realized that I had no right to ask Steve for any communication. I would really like to talk to him, but we have told his lawyer that I will only do so in response to a request from Steve. He never asked for this. I made no claim on his business and offered to divide our other assets equally, share the house on a rotating basis until Trixie finishes school, then we would split the cost of it, shared custody of the children, no child support on either side, and no spousal support. I wasn't going to give up his last name until Trixie's graduation, but if he still wants it, I'll do it. My lawyer was confident that I could do better and tried to convince me to ask for more. But I stood my ground. There were a couple of half-interested attempts on the part of Steve's lawyer to get more for Steve. But he also knew I could get more. So we soon came to the terms I proposed. Living in our house, but without each other, was strange for me. But the children, especially the girls, quickly got used to it, and that was the most important thing. Charlie seemed more thoughtful than usual, so working through Beth, Steve and I agreed to take him to a therapist. He responded well, and while he'll never be the guy with the lampshade on his head, he's back to being less serious than he was before the divorce. Beth organized weekly shifts by arriving half an hour before her shift, so either Steve or I would leave when the other one arrived. Even though he didn't talk to me, Steve always stood tall in front of the kids. Well, almost always. He took down every picture of me and placed them facing the wall in the office. I always hung them back for my week and then put them away before going to my parents. He never said anything bad about me to the kids and made sure they didn't hear anything negative from his family. I respected his boundaries. I owed him much more, but that was all he allowed me to do for him. I worked full-time at the clinic and my parents would pick up the kids and stay until I got home during my week with them. It wasn't a full life, but I had my children, my parents, and my job, all the things I liked. I gave up dating and I didn't know if Steve was seeing anyone or not. I suspect so. He was in his element in relationships and was a wonderful partner. The first time Steve spoke to me was after that terrible day on the dock at Katie's school play. I waited while he and his parents chose seats then sat on the other side of the large, multi-purpose room, behind them, so I was out of his line of sight. I had Trixie with me. Charlie was with a friend that evening, and when she saw her father after the performance, she rushed to him. I followed a few steps behind her and stopped a few feet away from him when he picked her up, causing her to yelp and laugh. I smiled, seeing their love. His gaze quickly found me. He always did this when we were a couple, and nodded to me. I smiled at him. I still loved him, even though I knew I couldn't be with him. 
We thought we'd take Katie out for ice cream to celebrate her performance. Can I visit her for a moment? I thought the same thing, but now I will always rely on him. Certainly. Why don't you take Trixie with you, too? He smiled a half-smile that did not reach his eyes. Thank you. We won't stay long. I'll go tell Katie and she'll meet you in front of the stage. I need to buy her suit. She was a manta ray, and I thought she killed the role. Fine. He turned with Trixie in his arms and walked towards the edge of the stage with his parents. And that was all. I didn't feel any love, but I didn't feel any tension either. It seemed that he had already forgotten about my betrayal. On the one hand, I was glad. On the other hand, I was sad. Soon he will move on to someone else. I walked into class to find Katie chatting animatedly with a couple of friends dressed as a lobster and a shark. You were great, honey. Mother, I was so nervous. I can argue, but you did great. Here, give me your suit. Dad's on stage with Grammy and Poppy, and they're going to invite you and Trixie out for ice cream. Hooray! Will you come too? Not tonight. I need to go home and clean the kitchen. After dinner, we had to hurry. I made sure Katie got to Steve and his parents. They made a big fuss about it, which made me smile. The guys looked like they were going to be okay. When I slipped away, my throat tightened. There will be joy ahead, both for Steve and for me but probably not together, and not nearly as much as I sacrificed with my stupidity. I prayed that Steve would find love again. He was an innocent man caught in this massacre, and he truly deserved his happiness. But now he had to find it on his own. The same applied to me. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.